Good morning. You know what goes, y'all come back, eh? That's a Canadian snowbird that spent six months a year in Texas. So. <laughs> I, uh, there was a story about Sir Lawrence Olivier, the actor, who of course is now deceased. When I gave this talk, it was, uh, part of it was impromptu. And uh, St. Lawrence Olivier gave one of his most brilliant performances of Hamlet you know, Shakespeare's Hamlet. And he walks off the stage, curtain comes down, and he goes into his dressing room and slams the door. Okay, and the audience is just thundering. You know, they want him back out again because this was the most terrific performance of Hamlet anyone had ever seen. You know, to be or not to be, that was the question, so. And finally, the stage manager, you know, after five minutes, he goes and he goes to the door and he opens it up and, he, and Olivier's fuming. And stage manager says, you were, you know, what, what's the problem? They're, they're thundering. They want you out there. He said, that was a terrific performance of Hamlet. And he said, yes, confound it. And I don't know how I did it. And I don't know if I can ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes when you're in the business of performing, and any time you're speaking publicly, it's, quote, performing, uh, you know, sometimes you just, the spirit leads you and you do it. And then you go, I can't do that again. So we had a good time in the first service. Let's see if we can do something here. Uh, the second one, Pastor Paul called me yesterday and said, you know, can you speak? I said, I really wanted to talk about what he talked about last week. I went home and listened to the second service. We were at the first service and listened to it again. And I wrote it all down here on my computer and, and, for, and put it in my notes because it's really important. And I do want to do something at some time in the future if Pastor Paul lets me do it. Uh, and that will be on what happens when you grow up in legalistic churches and the burden that legalism does as it destroys grace. And if many of you have grown up in those churches, you know what I'm talking about, and how fear keeps people from leaving those churches. This is really very important. And why grace is such a wonderful thing, why it was for Martin Luther. But anyway, you know, we have a friend of ours who's a, a mortician in Southern California, a very good believer. We've had a lot of good conversations. And I was down there for a, an engagement, and I stayed with, with Carol, and I stayed with him and his wife. They have a bizarre sense of humor. I kid you not. <laughs> Because, you know, I get my suit on, and you're looking spiffy. You got your, I think it was two-piece suit, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I come out of the bedroom, and I'm looking great. He says, wow. He says, you look spiffy. You're good enough to put in the box, you know. <laughs> you know? And I said, thank you, Dave. <laughs> I think that's a compliment, you know. Um, I wanted to talk today, I've noticed in dealing with postmoderns, that they have particular patterns of behaving. So before I start talking about this, why am I doing this? Because I'm sort of trying to be the bridge between the wonderful Bible teaching we get here and the worldview battles that are going out in the world. After I talked in the last service, there was one young girl who's being homeschooled who came up with a copy of Dave Nobles and Jeff Myers' book, Understanding the Times, and she was just thrilled with this book. I said, I am so thrilled you are reading that book because it is the one thing that every high school student, every Christian high school student, needs to read before they start challenging high school and especially into college from Summit Ministries. It explains everything that we're in the middle of. But the reason I'm doing this today is that the worldview war that we have been in here in the West, and I'm going to wander a bit if you don't mind since, you know. If I get out of camera range, just go, you're out of range! Okay, and I'll come back in again. Um, that the worldview war that we've been in the middle of here, probably since the early part of the 20th centuries, is now taking a new turn. And it's going to make special demands upon Christians. Before you could go behind the walls of the church and say, oh, well, we're just going to preach the gospel. Now, a lot of times that was a cop-out on the part of pastors and church elders who didn't want to confront the worldview wars. But the cost of that cop-out was losing 60 to 80% of our youth alone to this worldview battle. Just gone to the faith, as Ken Ham would point out, all right? Because once the Bible was undermined, you know, you can teach Bible, 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 and it's good to do that, okay? The word of God does not come back void. It's our foundation. But once some professor is able to undermine the Bible as being a source of truth, they just take the whole Bible, walk over to the trash can, and cut, chung, there it goes. 
That's it. Destroyed in one shot. Years of Bible teaching in churches. Because we've been sending kids into public schools and uh, colleges and elsewhere unprepared. All of this is coming home to roost. There are now efforts out there to flip evangelical churches, fundamental churches, Bible churches, Pentecostal churches, which have been a bulwark of trying to maintain stability in Christianity and to flip them away from their traditions and foundations into the new postmodern thought. It's an organized effort. It's well-funded in some cases. In a few ministries, Soros is providing the money. Radical leftist, neo-Marxist that he is. God bless him. I hope he gets saved. You know, don't hate my enemies. I pray for them. But that's why we're doing this today, because saying we're just going to teach the gospel anymore is not going to be adequate for any of us. Uh, I want to talk about society. It's better to light a candle, because that's Candlelight's motto. It's been mine for a long time. It's just a coincidence. Better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And heaven knows you probably have seen your share of darkness. I have too. Depression has been a friend at times but it's better to light a candle in the midst of it. And that's what we're called to do here. Um, There are three legs of any society. There's politics and law, religion or worldview, and and economics. No society in the world actually exists without them. If the religion of the society does not inform government, government will create a religion of its own and force it down on the churches. And that's the battle that we're seeing right now. We're in this critical transition point because when a worldview comes in, it goes through several stages. When what uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin a couple of weeks ago when I was talking with him, I don't know if you know who he is, he's a conservative uh, Jewish rabbi, and he said, I call it secular fundamentalism. It's been underway since the early 1920s. Uh, It was very concerted. I'll show you where it came from in just a second, but it demands to be heard. That's the first thing. Then it demands to be equal. And then it finally demands to be exclusive. And we're now in this war. The Western sphere, the Western world, which was founded on Judeo-Christianity, and we went through the Renaissance period, we went through the Enlightenment, we went through the Reformation. The Reformation played a key role in transforming us into a free and prosperous Western society. Uh, not only is it under attack, but we have been, it has been under attack for over 60 years in academia and in the media. So Western civilization right now is literally chewing out its own guts. And it's bizarre because you watch the people doing it using the benefits of Western society, freedom of speech, the prosperity we have, the technology we have, all of the things we've gained because of this change that started around the Reformation time. They're using that to condemn it. This is bizarre, but this is what all of postmodernism is all about. So we have these three legs. The glue is language. It's why a people must speak a common language or one or two languages. You can't get away with much more. Multiculturalism does not work. Why? Because a culture has a norm for behaving, what is right, what is wrong, and you can't have several of these existing in the same physical space simultaneously without severe friction and chaos. It's impossible. This is something you don't want. In countries where there are dual languages, I'm amazed that Switzerland has been able to hold itself together for as many centuries because there are three, four different languages in Switzerland, Romanche, German, French, and Italian. But somehow they've managed to do it. And each canton in Switzerland speaks a separate subdialect, which the people in the next canton over cannot understand. But they've managed to hold a country together. But even in Canada, for example, you've had issues of d- dissension between the Anglophones and the Francophones. You know, those who speak French, etc. So this is what it is. And you cannot separate them. This is important to keep in your mind. Sometimes when I speak in churches, people go, well, this isn't religious stuff. Well, yeah, it is. Because now, this new postmodern worldview wants to come along and it wants to invade the churches now. There is a concerted effort to flip the churches. So this is going to demand a whole new method of thought uh, for all of us right now. We're told we're a nation divided. Carol took that. We do, we do all our own photos, by the way. So we, we're a nation divided. Why? Because starting in the early part of the 1900s, we had an imposter come in. This imposter was a composite of several different worldviews that were already underway out there. The first one was what was called Gramscian Marxism. 
Antonio Gramsci was an Italian Marxist, and he recognized that, that we were not going to be able to flip over the Western world into communism if we tried to do it the way Lenin had done it in Russia. This was not going to work. The Western world was too firmly grounded in its Christian heritage and its Christian morals, and therefore they would have to do something different. You would have to have a long march through the culture, acquiring believers as you went, taking control of education and of the media and other organs of social intercourse in order to gradually transform the culture. Whenever you hear somebody use the word transformation, you're listening to a Gramscian Marxist. There are three stages, traditional, trans, uh, tr transitional, and transformational. Three stages in that form of Marxism that exists out there. He was the first source. The second were the, the humanists that came on the scene. They were fellow travelers. One of the predominant ones was President Woodrow Wilson, who didn't like our Constitution, thought we needed to trash it and bring in a new Constitution. Uh, he did not like free markets. He believed that we needed to have sort of an oligarchic, uh, planned type of economy, etc. These were the early humanists, Humanist Manifesto I, one of whom was John Dewey. He's known as being the father of modern public education. John Dewey went to the Soviet Union to find out. He was thrilled with Stalin's experiment there. And he went to the Soviet Union to find out how they indoctrinate their children in the dialectical ideas of dialectical materialism, otherwise known as Marxism, atheistic Marxism. All right. And Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey is one that you may or may not know very well. She was the successor to Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, an occultist. Uh, Alice Bailey did far more than Blavatsky. She passed away in, I believe, 1948-49. She came up with a series of books that she channeled from a demon spirit named Jual Kul. She called him his, her ascended Tibetan master. And this thing called The Plan for the Conversion of Western Society uh, exists today. Unless you think she was some sort of a New Age kook the company she founded was originally called Lucifer, Lucifer Publishing Company. That's a clue, okay, <laughs> as to where they started. Today, that company is called Lucis Trust. It's a major non-governmental organization at the United Nations. And if you look, most of her ideas in what was called the plan, you can get these little booklets, and the one on education is very revealing. You have been implemented in American public education today. So, going through the 20s and 30s, these fellow travelers gained steam in the area of academia. By the 1940s, they had control of the teachers' colleges. Now, it's not a conspiracy. It's like an ongoing evangelization, trying to find fellow believers as you went. By the 50s, you began to see the shift in public education, where they would refer to traditional teachers as defective teachers. They were not the transitional, transformational teachers who were going to transform society. It's like President Obama said, we need to transform the country. Well, really? What are we transforming from? And you better ask where you're transforming to before you get there, right? But he was using that dialectical language. As a matter of fact, the day that uh, the president was uh, giving his uh, speech, I called it I Am Apollo speech at the Mile High Stadium, in the Denver, Colorado. We were there in Colorado for that speech. We, I didn't bother to go. We ha I had my press credentials, but Carol and I didn't bother to go. We watched it from her parents' house. And uh, as he was speaking, I, I said, do you notice this? He's doing the dialectical process that change agents and Alinskyites use. You, you could actually predict what he was going to do because I knew that he had learned the Alinsky method. He liked the Alinsky method. He taught it when he was a community organizer in Chicago. It's nothing but rehash Marxism, okay? Uh, and so these were the legs, the Alice Bailey, John Dewey, Woodrow Wilson and the humanists, Antonio Gramsci, Humanist Manifesto I with Woodrow Wilson and all the ones who signed it. And that is why we have an imposter worldview largely based on the very same ideas that staged the French Revolution, hostile to Christianity, hostile to Western civilization, hostile to free markets, great in favor of socialism, in favor of oligarchic or some kind of top-down management of society, to achieve some kind of a utopia. This is why we are a divided nation today. It's not just that we disagree over issues. At one time, 50 years ago, 
Democrats and Republicans could agree that we agreed what the country was, what the Constitution was, what our foundation was, what Christianity was all about. We would just disagree over certain issues. That has all changed now because the, I'll call them the progressive Marxists, started in the 50s to invade the Democratic Party. And that was the first party to take it over, they, they, they took over. So today, it's very hard for people to understand the difference between a liberal, a classic blue dog liberal, I grew up in that kind of a family, all right, versus a progressive. A real hardcore progressive is a neo-Marxist. You've got to understand that. With big dollops of occultism thrown in and a few other things. That's why we're a divided country. And it's now invading the church. That's the important part. So why is it we are in this division? So we have two radically different groups. They start with two different radically different worldviews, two different thought processes. One uses logic and traditional thinking. The other uses consensus, relative thinking. I'll explain that in a second. They arrive at two different conclusions. We have no common ground, and they just don't understand why the other side doesn't get it. Okay? And that's why they're like this all the time. Okay? Because they have been trained differently. And you can, you can benchmark when the changes actually happened in American education. It, the Deweyites came in and they started the change. The first eruption of this occurred in my generation, the baby boomers, and the flower child rebellion of the 60s. Rebellion against the establishment, rebellion against Christianity, free drugs, free sex, free everything. As long as it didn't hurt anybody, you were good to go. Well, how do you like where we are right now? We're at, we're at the result of the tail end of that. The second benchmark was the 1989 conference, the Governor's Conference on Education, chaired by Governor Bill Clinton, and the conference was concluded ultimately a year or so later by Colorado Governor Roy Romer. The keynote speaker for that year was Dr. Shirley McCune, formerly of the Mid-Continental Regional Laboratories, who said we're going to change, transform all of education. We're no longer going to teach facts to kids. We're going to teach them how to think. And what she meant is in collective consensus thought patterns, not in what you or I would call critical thinking, the way we have established Christianity and other thought. Okay, postmodern thought has put us, and this is what you're dealing with on the other side, and you might as well know what it is, because it'll answer all the questions. Well, why don't they do this? Why are my grandkids doing that? Blah, blah, blah. Let me explain to you. We're on a pitching deck. Ever tried to walk during a storm on a, in on a ship or something, or on an aircraft when you're in turbulence? You know, you're like this. You're unstable all the time. You're trying to grab onto something. Have you noticed that everything's always changing? There's always a crisis. We're never done. It doesn't make any difference. Who gets what? There's another crisis immediately at the door. We're on a pitching deck, which emphasizes feelings and consensus, not critical thought. When an idea becomes weaponized, truth is the first casualty. Truth is not the issue. It's only adherence to the latest political correctness, even if it's wrong. All right? These thoughts are based on relative ideas. As Christians, we root in the scriptures. We root in the Bible and what Christianity has done and prior to that, Judaism. That's our foundation. And we have a reference point to that that's always there in the Constitution, in the country. That was our reference point. That's the foundation of our law. And it guarantees our rights. All right? But they believe in relative ideas. There is no absolute truth. As this girl that came up in the last, after the last... Uh, uh, session, and she was saying, she said, you know, when she talks to her friends, they like to tell her there are no absolute truths. And she said, yeah, but you just said that absolutely. See, she's smart enough to figure that out. And I had a guy come back and said, well, there's no absolute truth except the one absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. And I said, who said? <laughs> Where do you get that? What do you? And they're not. They're picking it out of the air like this. And so everything that they're doing keeps moving into different relative positions from moment to moment and time to time. That's why we're on this constantly changing deck. All right, that's the next part of it. It's constantly changing. Have you noticed even in the area of politics, everything's always changing. We have this crisis, blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden we move on to the next crisis and it never stops. It's constantly changing. Even the morality that is changing. Do you realize that virtually everything today that the politically correct crowd are preaching to us, they preach just the opposite of that 50 years ago? Everything's flipped. We're calling good evil, evil good, dark light, light dark, and we know from the scriptures that's a no-no. God actually puts a woe on top of it. Why? Because it disorients everybody, and we can't live like that. And the one that's really important is compartmentalized ideas. This will explain a lot. 
Uh, Pastor Paul invited me to go to lunch 20 years ago. You say, free food? I'll be there. Okay. And he said, you know, John, I'm trying to understand this. And it's not because Pastor Paul's dumb. It's because he's busy pastoring and I'm busy following these issues. And he said, I'm not sure why our Bible teaching for the youth groups isn't working. He said, we're teaching them scriptures on Sunday, but on Monday you'd never know that. They're shacking up with their girlfriends. They're, you know, using drugs. They're doing whatever it is they're doing. I said, I don't understand this. So he went on for a while and to explain to me what he was saying. And I said, okay, Paul, here's your problem. Let me see if I can explain this to you. Your problem is not with what you're teaching in the Bible classes to the youth. Your problem is how the youth are being taught to think in the public school system. And then I explained it to him. And I said, the most important factor of this is what I call compartmentalization. And so what I mean by that is, okay, over here is my Bible compartment. Over here is my sex life compartment. Over here is my drug and social life. Over here is my online life. Here's my at school life. Here's what I do with my parents. And I can have contradictions because there's no absolute truth, remember? I can have contradictions in all of these categories. And the only unpardonable sin is to open a valve between the, co the compartments so that the contradictions become visible. And as I was talking, I could see it on Pastor Paul's face. He goes, you're describing the kids. I said, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'd only discovered that a few years ago. You know, uh, uh, Christmas weekend on my radio show, we reran a panel discussion we did at KWGN-TV and ch uh, Channel 2 in Denver back in 1994. I had four panelists all telling where education was going to go. And that was based on what was happening in the Governor's Conference and all of the new programs that were coming in. And back at the time, even teachers were saying, oh, you're badly uninformed, you don't know what you're talking about. I was stunned listening to this again after 25 years. They knew exactly where we were headed. So this compartmentalization is really important. And it's why they get so upset when you begin to punch through that. In other words, if you talk to a postmodern person, and it's not their fault, this is the way they've been taught to think. If you start to punch into their ideas with logic and reason, they get really agitated. You'll see this early on. And they go, they either run away or they have a boom response. Now, the runaway happened here one night. This was a few years back. Pastor Paul was talking. I think it was a Wednesday night. I was going to speak, so I'm standing here looking holy. You know, that's what you're supposed to do in church, right? And uh, it's not that funny. <laughs> oh, ye of so little faith. <laughs> and Pastor Paul was talking about the, the importance of upholding the right to bear arms, which we just saw, by the way, in a church in Fort Worth, Texas, okay? Why this is important. Because if you can't assure that there are no weapons in the country, then the only way to stop force is with force. That's it, okay? And people say, well, we're just going to ban all the weapons. Good, you're going to build a wall along the southern border? Because do you think the narcos for one second aren't going to open up a branch office of illegal weapons trafficking along with the drugs? You're crazy, okay? But this doctor gets up, and he must have been at the medical center, and he said he's opposed to that. What, guns are doing horrible things. He sees the damage in the ER that they do. I, I agree. We have a problem, but we don't have a gun problem or a knife problem, which they had in Australia when they banned guns. We have a moral problem. Okay. Why is it? You know, my father-in-law just passed away last year at the age of 98. He used to ride a horse to a one-room school in western Colorado with a 22 rifle in the saddle holster, as did all of his friends. They weren't shooting each other. Why? Because we had a different moral base to the country. But anyway, I'm standing here, and this doctor gets up, and he objects to what Pastor Paul is saying. And Paul was dealing with it. I mean, he, he did okay. I'm sitting here thinking, invite him down. Invite him down. Bring him down here. You know, I mean, if we do, but we were going to do something else that night, so we didn't. And so this doctor made his point, and whoop, goes right out the back door. And I've seen this over and over again. And I keep wondering, why do they run away from the sound of battle? And the reason is, they're in their own bubble echo chamber. And their relative system only stays together as long as they tell each other it's all great and good and everything's A-OK. -okay. As soon as you begin to take it apart, like even the area of gun control, say, for example, okay, we have a problem with, gu with guns. Okay, good, that's question number one. The killers are all, not the killers physically in terms of violence, the killer questions are always questions number two and three. Okay, good, we have a problem with guns. What are you going to do? 
And I saw this on Fox News uh, was a few months ago. They had a liberal guy on talking about the imperative of, we have this moral imperative to get this gun violence under control, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's question number one. But one of the other panelists was saying, yeah, but what are you going to do? And as he kept coming up with these solutions, the guy would say, that's not going to work because of this and this. And the man proposing it was becoming more and more agitated. You could see this. And finally, he got up and walked from the, the set. And to his own Facebook page, I saw the flip later, puts this whole thing. He's walking down the street in New York. We have this moral imperative to get this gun. I got that. Okay, he couldn't get beyond question number one. Because of his postmodern thinking, he could not understand that it's okay that we have a moral imperative. What are you going to do? You know, that's the second part of it. So here we are. This is a nation divided. We're in a take-no-prisoners acrimony. It's a rejection of traditional Judeo-Christianity as our base for moral ethics and law. We're being transformed into a global pantheistic socialism. And we have two radically different groups of people. So what does that mean right now? Where are we going as we are? at this point. Let me show you how it sort of, how the two visions are clashing with each other. Because where we're going is important. This is what's going to affect the church. This new worldview is now in stage three of its transition into wanting to be exclusive. It is not going to leave the church alone. Any church. You either conform to their ideas or there will be consequences. They want to revoke tax-exempt status, they want to do this, they want to charge you property taxes, they want to prevent this. If you're a Christian, you can't practice your faith because you will be forced to conform. Doctors and healthcare workers are really concerned, especially in Canada, Christian doctors and nurses, because they're just on the edge of being forced to actually do assisted suicide, be forced into doing that, uh, or abortions or other things they consider to be immoral. The days of being a milquetoast Christian are over. And being a Christian will demand something of you. Okay, let's look at our vision of humanity based on Judeo-Christian thought and history. Okay, that's what we have here in this country. We came from a Judeo-Christian society. We got to freedom over about a thousand years, starting with the thought of some of the Greek philosophers and Thomas Aquinas, a Catholic a theologian in the Middle Ages, went through the Renaissance. Then especially the Reformation played a major role in establishing the value of individual human beings. The Renaissance and the Enlightenment laid the groundwork for the freedoms that we established, especially in the Anglosphere, that we have enjoyed. Vision number two, based on secular humanism, Rabbi Daniel Lappin calls it secular fundamentalism. It believes that human rights are given by the state. Let's look at that, rights of man. Or the vision one, we base it on the original 1787 Constitution as amended, founded in natural rights of the Declaration of Independence. Remember that? Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator by certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He establishes that in philosophy, which is called a priori. It's established as a non-needing-to-prove fact that this is where we are, and that governments are to secure those rights among people. This was a radical change from the divine right of kings, but it was our foundation. Today's what I call progressive Marxists and remember, there's a difference between your liberal friends and those who are the real hardcore progressive elites. Most of them don't know what the difference is. But progressivism has been invaded, or has invaded, first of all, liberalism, and it's a good part of the way into conservatism today, into the Republican Party as well. And elsewhere, we are not the only country going through this worldview war. The Brexit vote in Great Britain is part of that. Things going on in Canada, in Germany, in France. They are further down the sewer pipe than we are, okay? They're having a harder time to get back. I talked to Elizabeth Sabatish Wolf, who was prosecuted for her statements on Islam, and she said, truth isn't the issue anymore. It's whether or not you're politically correct. You can say something that's totally true. If it's politically incorrect, you may wind up in jail or fine. That's where we are. But their vision, they believe that the Constitution is defective. That's why we hear about a living, breathing Constitution. It has to change. It has to have new rights with new goals and new meanings established by activist judges. It bases itself on an evolutionary type basis of constantly changing rights based on membership in various classes and groups. It's a war of oppressed and oppressors, ever-changing categories of race, ethnicity, gender, and class. When you hear them talk about intersectionality, intersectionality is simply an effort 
on the part of some academics to reconcile all of the illogical self-contradictions of this whole system. And heaven help you if you don't go along with it, because it's the latest and greatest. And that's what we're always under right now. And so our political process reflects this horrible, horrible worldview clash that we're in right now. So we're moving from the time when churches could just go, people could go to church, pastors could go into church and say, well, we're just going to preach the gospel. I finally, when it became obvious that that was a cop-out for pastors who didn't want to engage this battle, and I don't know why they wouldn't want to engage it because we were losing, depending on your denomination, 60 to 80 percent of your teenagers to the faith are gone because we don't teach them how to fight this worldview battle that we're in or what it's all about. But um, that's where they would say, we're just going to teach the gospel. And I would say, well, why bother? They're not going to use it. You know, the gospel is a call to action. Our mission statement's always been the same. Go and make disciples. Right? Teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I've been with you all days, even to the end of the world. Which, given the way things are going, one could hope might come quickly. You know? <laughs> The mission statement has never changed. But, according to the new rules, that's intolerance. That's hate. That's hate speech. When you say that one belief is better than another belief, when one society is better than another. You have to recognize that in all of the things that they have been preaching at us for the last 50 years, the vicious assault that's gone on against Christianity in academia, you should see the number of attacks on Christian churches in Europe going on. Not only is there a rise of virulent anti-Semitism, but attacks and destructions of Christian churches that are going on right now. In this 50-year assault, it's now reaching a peak, and these toxic ideas have come home. And uh, what happens is, is our media are no longer a source, and I've been in media about two-thirds of my career for the last 54 years has been in news talk. And they are no longer purveyors of news. They're no longer prof professional journalists. They are purveyors of narratives. Do you realize, if we talk about these relative values, and I now want to talk about the good news about being a candle, but if these relative values, I've been watching the circus in the House of Representatives. And remember, this is just one little significance of what's going on in the entire Western sphere and the Anglo sphere. Do you realize every principle contained in the Bill of Rights of protection of you and me that we would have if we were criminally accused, every protection that's built in there to keep error was violated by the House of Representatives during this witch hunt. Everybody knows it's a witch hunt. They said they were going to do this impeachment process before they had anything to impeach about. Okay? I'm sorry, this is not the way it's supposed to work. And what we're doing for the sake of short-term game and relative values, we are wrecking the whole system. We are literally, in the West, blowing out giant chunks of our foundation and hoping that our faith and our, and our freedoms and governments will stand intact. They won't if we keep going along this way. And that's where, are, that's where we are right now. We are in this moment when all we can do is realize, okay, we're at a critical moment in our history. And this isn't a time for being negative. This is when we need to move. We, we need to do what we do. Because you are standing on a firm foundation. If you're standing on the word of God, if you're standing on the foundations of the country, you're on a firm foundation. The other people are not. They're standing, standing on squishy sand because it's always changing. And the only thing that holds it together for them is this glue where they tell each other that it's okay and it works and they're right and they're the enlightened group. But the problem is, because of that, they're not hearing the word of God. They're not hearing salvation. They're becoming a danger to themselves. They don't even know it and to the system because every socialist revolution in the history of the world the transformation that the elites are always talking about, every socialist revolution devours its own children. Richard Wormbrand pointed that out after 14 years of being in prison in Romania under the Soviets. Okay? Every revolution, it even devoured some of the most devout Communist Party members. And so that's why we have to bear witness to the truth. We are at this point where we're either going to reform and reforms are always necessary in every organization. They shouldn't frighten us. Because the sin nature of mankind, no matter how good a foundation we had in this country, 
the foundation that got us our freedoms, our prosperities, the ability to practice our religion. We were able to abolish slavery, which many countries never succeeded in doing. We've dealt with many other critical issues. That's all on the table now. So we will either reform and go back to the foundation that we have stood upon, which is where you and I come in, or we're going to flip forward into what they think is a radical, transformational, utopian future. And in reality, it's the same old Marxist claptrap that we have heard for centuries now. It actually goes back to the French Revolution and the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. If there was one difference between what was taught during the French Revolution and our revolution, our revolution st stood on the idea that there were innate rights given to us by God, and the framers of our Constitution understood that we had a sin nature, and that that sin nature would manifest itself whenever it could, which is why we divided the powers of government up among different groups, so that power would not be concentrated in one group of people. The French Revolution started by getting rid of God, and said we could just let the gentle citizen, this was Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau fathered anywhere between seven and nine kids, never raised a single one of them. He'd dump them off the door of the orphanage and went on to pursue his great vi vision. And he said, if we just let the gentle native that's in us, that's been so messed up by religion and religious values, if we just let it loose, everything will become blissful. Well, it was if you didn't need your head, you know. Look at all the people. And every revolution that has started on the basis of that, the Marxist revolution just picked up that torch and ran with it again. The revolution in China picked up that torch and ran with it again. We have 130 million people who are dead. And when you hear these proposals coming from these people, it's the same claptrap. This is where we are. And it will not leave our church alone. Sooner or later, everybody in the workplace or in the public place, the public square, or even in the churches, what we can do or say will be under duress and challenge today. And we have to be willing to stand. Because the new totalitarianism, if it comes about, and maybe this is the end times, maybe this is the time for the Antichrist. We're moving into this globalist paradigm, maybe that's it. But either way, we have to stand for where truth is at every single point. And there are two methods of persecution, coercion and co-opting. Coercion is we penalize you, we throw you in jail, we fine you, we seize your property, we make you look like a social outcast. It's what's going on in China right now with their social credit score for Christians who are there. And co-opting, this is the process. There are a number of organizations and ministries. Do you see that conflict going on in Christianity today? The, the editorial that was controversial? I call it apostasy today. Okay. Um, there is now a concerted effort to flip Bible-related churches, whether they're evangelical, Pentecostal, fundamental, to flip them away from our Christian roots and to accept the new paradigm rather than the biblical paradigm. It's organized and it's funded. The Catholic Church has been undergoing this since Vatican II. There's been a covert civil war, a polite civil war, that's been going on on the very same terms. Traditional Roman Catholicism versus all of this new stuff, the social justice stuff, which is reclassified Marxism. Same old stuff, new label put on the top. They were calling it, it wasn't social justice, it was the peace and justice commissions, and they tried to convert Latin America with it, and look at the disaster that happened in Nicaragua and everything else. Uh, it, that war came to the surface in the Catholic Church after the election of Pope Francis, and it finally just blew it across the top and became virulent and very active. So the woke people are telling us they're woke up to what we are. I actually woke up to what they were about 20 years ago. Uh, and what has happened is large numbers of people are now saying, okay, stop. That's what's happening in Great Britain right now. Stop. We see where you're leading us. The real question is, where are we going to stand then? This is the important part as we close out today. The mission statement of the church never changes. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is from Matthew 28. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And this stuff is satanically driven. Have no doubt about it. And it says further on, and having done all, to stand. 
When you stand, you have to stand on a solid foundation. You cannot stand on squishy sand. You have to know where you as a Christian stand. In religion, it's on the scriptures. In our political legal life, it's on the Constitution. It's what guarantees our foundation and our freedom and our organization. So here's a question. We're going to fight the good fight, contend for the faith, handed once for, the, for all to the saints, because it will come under attack. It is under attack right now. And in many places, in castles which were long, formerly strongholds, the walls have been breached. So now what are we going to do? We're going to stand, we're going to hunker down. You can only hunker down so long until there's no more hunker down room. If others run away from the sound of battle, what will we do? If others spit in the face of Christ, what will we do? You're going to spit in the face of Christ? Easy to do. You get caught, blindsided, you'll do it faster than you think. Okay? If others bear witness to the lie, what will we do? Will we bear witness to the truth? If they deny the existence of truth, what will we do? These are questions, and they're not guilt questions. They're battle questions we have to ask. You know, a lot of times... Denominations ask guilt questions. Have we served the Lord this week with our whole heart, mind, and soul? No, I never do. Every week I have to admit I didn't really do what I could have done. Okay? Those don't work. I'm saying, what will we do? You see, it's not important for us to know what somebody else is going to do. What's important for you and me is what we will do in this time that will try people's hearts. But above all, it's when people rise to greatness. God bless. Don't forget to pray for the persecuted church.